Okay, welcome back to the symposium. Now we have a second session with Professor Milford and Professor Baraka. And um, first of all, before we start, I would like to say um, maybe you could come a little bit closer or you can also go up to the balcony um, because we saw in the last lecture that some people were standing behind, so maybe they will also find a place to sit. And after that, I will welcome Professor Karl Milford. Uh, he has written his dissertation in 1986 on Karl Menger's methodolo methodology, supervised by Professor Erich Streichler and Sir Karl Popper. Uh, he then became assistant to Professor Streichler and Professor Sir Karl Popper, and wrote his habilitation in 1996, covered the basis of investigations regarding the development of economic theory and the epistemological positions defended by economists with emphasis on uh, 19th century German economics and the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, Professor Milford teaches at the economics department of the University of Vienna, and his main fields of research are history of uh, economic theory and philosophy of science. So thank you very much for that thank introduction. <laughs> now, it is, of course, an unexpected pleasure to participate in a conference organized by students. And I would like to convey my gratitude, particularly to Mr. Del Santo, but also to the organizers of this, uh, uh, con uh, this symposium. Now, I will emphasize or I will talk about methodological problems and epistemological problems. I will not talk about perhaps pragmatic problems which have been investigated in the previous talks by Professor Nemeth and Docent Dumberg. However, my methodological talk also has some implications regarding pragmatic decisions. We will come to that later. The talk is constructed, or rather, the structure of the talk is that I will first start discussing some types of social science explanations relating it to the so-called problems of induction and demarcation. I will immediately explain those two problems. Then I will continue and show how different epistemological positions are to be inferred from the premises, from a set of premises which describe the logical and epistemological situation raised by Hume's objection against the problem of induction and implicitly against certain solutions of the problem of uh, demarcation. And the third section deals with ideas regarding scientific progress. And in that context, Perhaps I have time to make some remarks regarding practical decisions or pragmatic decisions. So let me start. I already indicated some of these uh, remarks, by the way, when talking about non-justificationism and the so-called pragmatic problem of induction. Now, if we look at different types of social science explanations, we may distinguish four types of methodological nominalist explanations and four types of methodological essentialist explanations. By the way, the prefix methodological just means that I'm talking about science. It's not, it does not indicate that I'm talking about a particular method, how to reach a certain result. I'm just talking about science. That is, for instance, what scientists regard as a satisfactory explanation. If you go to the library, what you find there are books, tons of books, all containing different theories. They all show different structures regarding the types of argument. Methodological nominalist explanation in the social sciences 
basically maintain that the method of the social sciences is situational analysis. So for instance, social sciences probably would not regard singular theoretical explanations to be much important, but I'm going to draw on the structure of singular, of singular theoretical explanations because it's just a simple way to circumscribe and illustrate the problems I'm talking about. Likewise, singular historical explanation, methodological individualism. Methodological individualism, for instance, maintains that satisfactory explanations in the social sciences are explanations that explain institutions as the unintended outcome of the interplay of individual plans, individual intentions. And we have macro-analysis, macro that is an analysis regarding the aggregate, aggregate uh, systems, trying to uncover laws between different how shall I say, social aggregates. Methodological essentialist explanations usually maintain that the method of the social sciences is historical, that the task of social sciences is to uncover the origin of institutions and to explain the development of those institutions. We have holistic explanations. Marx analysis, for instance, is a kind of holistic explanation. Marx does not aim at explaining individual exchange of commodities, rather the function of certain social institutions. We have inductivist ex uh, essentialist explanation, which were quite prominent in the 19th century because it was thought, particularly by so-called uh, representatives of histor historism, and in particular of historicism, that the task of the social sciences is to uncover laws of historical development on the basis of data, on the basis of singular observational statements. That is, it was simply a transference of old Baconian idea that science starts with observations and that by generalizing from those observations it is possible by content enlarging and truth preserving inferences to establish proven true social theories like Bacon idea was, well, a very optimistic epistemological idea was, well, get rid of your theoretical prejudice. If you get rid of your theoretical prejudice, you are capable of observing the facts as they, real, as they really are. You can observe the naked facts and accordingly are capable of formulating singular observational, observational statements that are proven true and if inductive inferences are valid, it is possible by inferring, by content enlarging and truth preserving inferences to establish statements and theories that are strictly universal and empirical. Strict, universal, strict universality means that those theories claim to be true independent of time and location. Note that they do not have to be proven true if I just mention uh, if I just define the term strict universality. Now, let's, in order to explain the problem of induction and demarcation, I will, in a minute, review the structure of a singular theoretical explanation. Mutatis mutandis, we get those results also if we consider models in the social sciences. I'm not going into that due to the shortage of time. Now, the problem of induction is that Hume formulated a very trivial insight. If science starts with observations, records, I do not believe that science starts with observations, science starts with problems, but it was maintained that in order to acquire genuine scientific knowledge, and genuine scientific knowledge was characterized as proven true knowledge, as knowledge that can be classified, theories that can be classified with absolute certainty as true. Well, if content, or in other words, according to this view, verification is possible. Now, Hume simply objected 
to this idea of content enlarging and truth preserving inferences by saying, well, if you have a finite or even infinite class of single observational statements, it is not possible to logically, validly to infer statements like all swans are white. If you have 10 observations, 100 observations, 1,000 observations, a million, a trillion observations of white swans, you are not logically entitled to infer the statement the specific general statement that is empirical that all swans are white. That's a simple logical objection. But it has catastrophic methodological and epistemological consequences. And I'm going to relate to these consequences in a minute. And the point is that due to this simple logical objections, Philosophers, in the aftermath of Hume, got very agitated in order to solve the problem. Because it was thought that, for instance, that empirical science can be demarcated from other realms of human knowledge. From mathematics, for instance, from logic that is non-empirical science, by maintaining that it's precisely the method of induction that is the method of content and logic and truth preserving inferences that characterizes empirical science. I will show you in a minute one. Now, why do we need statements that are specific, general, and empirical? The answer to this is to be found in the analysis of the structure of explanations and in particular to that singular theoretical explanation. We try to explain an observation and we formulate that observation in terms of an observational statement. At K1, T1, there's a non-living that is that professor, not a living non-dead one. We have to exclude the passing by of a living one. And we want to explain this. And one possibility, of course, is to venture or to propose a simple historical, a simple singular hypothesis saying, oh, well, that poor professor ate in the student's restaurant. And it's not so bad, because you can check this statement, right? You can go to the student's restaurant and ask, has Professor Milford eaten in the student's restaurant? Probably you get an affirmative answer. And of course, you can check that statement by saying, well, he ate. But why did he die? So presumably you assume, well, perhaps he was poisoned. And you can start or trigger or launch an autop autopsy and check the contents of the stomach. And perhaps you'll find that he was administered arsenic. Now note, this is a singular statement, a single observation or a single empirical or single existential statement saying that professor here has eaten in the student's <coughs> restaurant. You cannot infer your explanandum that is the statement that describes the singular process or the singular statement from another singular statement only. You need a second premise in order to formulate what scientists consider to be a satisfactory explanation. And that is what we usually call a law of nature. Now, I'm not discussing whether the natural universe is governed by deterministic laws. It doesn't interest me. I'm just talking about the types of statements scientists use, in fact, when they formulate singular, singular theoretical explanations. The philosophical jargon goes, this is a transcendental analysis. It's not pure logic. It's not empirical. It's transcendental. We have to meet separate critical standards here in order to decide uh, about the acceptability of methodological statements. Anyway, so we have the general law here, all humans eating a specified quantity of arsenic dye. 
And the logical equivalent is neg a negative universal existential statement, there exists no human, so eating a specified quantity of arsenic will not die. Of course, you know you can, to a certain extent, immunize yourself from uh, the consequences of taking arsenic. We have a second set of premises, the so-called singular initial conditions describing the concrete historical situation. And from those two kinds of premises, it is possible logically to infer that singular statements. By the way, this is just a methodological reinterpretation of an old problem that is that of causality. If you read Hume, you'll find that Hume is very worried about the possibility of so-called causal laws. He maintained the, the, the idea at that time was that cause and effect have to be connected by necessity. Causal laws are laws where cause and effect are necessarily connected. Now, this is impossible to interpret what's the cause, is the cause of an effect, it's the effect of a cause of a different effect, etc., etc., and necessity cannot be observed. This is what really Hume worried about. Anyway, so this is a, here we have a simple methodological transformation of this philosophical problem. We identify the causes being formulated in singular initial conditions, and we formulate the effect as the explanandum, and the necessity, as it were, is characterized by this logical deductive inference. So, for reasons which I'm not going to explain now, we are we want to introduce such strictly universal and empirical statements, which we call laws. They are strictly universal. They claim to be true independent of time and location, the past and the future and the present in every corner of the universe. But we cannot know whether they are true or false. If I talk about truths, I mean, for instance, Tarskist theory of objective truths. It's very, in terms, reinterpreted in terms of a correspondence theory of truth. So I have no problems talking about truth. The philosophical problem here is, how is it possible that facts correspond to statements? Right? This is the philosophical problem. Perhaps once in your lifetime you will be the father or mother of a very small daughter, and you ask her, run up to the bathroom, brush your teeth. And in two or three seconds she comes down, grins at you and says, I brushed my teeth. Whatever she did in the bathroom is a fact. Only statements can be true or false. Of course, you know she lied to you because it's impossible to brush teeth in three seconds. Right? So, this was a philosophical problem. And Wittgenstein and Bertrand Russell, for instance, uh, used picture theories in order to explicate that problem. Right? So, you may say a vinyl record is the picture, particularly the engravings on the record, is the picture of the sound you hear. From, uh, from the loudspeakers. So there's no problem in introducing the idea of truth. And Tarski developed the meta-semantic, uh, 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 solved the problem by using a meta-semantic language here. We are capable of introducing or retaining the idea of objective truth as a regulative idea of science. Just to mention, this is just an explication of what it means when I talk about truth. Now, the result here is that we, the result of this previous section, of the first section, is we need, for logical reasons, we have to introduce such strictly universal statements that are empirical. Now, empirical means that all statements that are empirical or that science proposes are decided 
by experience. Experience is a program here. It's not a psychological problem. It's a program. Perhaps you can imagine all the single observational data upon which scientists agree. And that's difficult enough, because scientists, particularly in the social sciences, do not happen to agree on statistics, do not happen to agree on observational statements. Nevertheless, sometimes they do, and those statements are provisionally only. Of course, we, it is possible to introduce so-called universal existential statements in such explanations. But universal, explana universal existential explanations are not very informative. If I say there exist white swans, it does not rule out the fact that a black, a pink, or some sw other swan may exist. And of course, if you infer such a statement, you can only infer an explanandum saying there's the possibility that at K1, P1, there's a dead professor as a prediction. Now, I told you about Hume's objection, and I indicated perhaps the problem already. The problem is, if we claim that we require statements that are strictly universal or specific, general, and empirical for such explanations, that are empirical for explanations, there's a problem, because if we say that strictly universal statements claim to be true independent of time and location, how is it possible that experience decides about is the basis of the truth decision of such statements? Experience is the given, as it were, but strict universality means that those statements transcend experience. So how is it possible that statements that claim to be true, independent of time and location, that are specific, general, or strictly universal, are decided by experience? Or in other words, you maintained we cannot verify. Verification does not exist. Now, you see, we may try to infer so-called epistemological positions. I have five epistemological positions here from those premises here. We have those solutions can be classified, the existing solutions can be classified into inductivist solutions and deductivist solutions. And inductivist solutions share a general premise. Basically, that premise maintains that science starts with observations. But as I said, science does not start with observation. It starts with problems. Because if I would ask you, go to the window and observe, you probably would turn around to me, scratching your forehead, perhaps thinking, God, this man has gone completely imbecile, but politely asking, what shall I observe? And the point is, of course, that I have to provide you with a theoretical aspect of that, uh, of that observation. I say, oh, well, all red cars turning into Strudelhofgasse. Right? Now, that's a psychological argument, and that's not very interesting, because psychology is an empirical discipline. And the demarcation problem is precisely about the problem of how to demarcate empirical science from non-empirical science. So we need a logical argument. Now look, aren't there any bottles of water on the table? No. Oh yes, there's one. Lovely. Look, if I say, if I, if I formulate the observational statement, at this table here, there is a bottle of water, you find that in order to formulate a simple observational statement, I need to introduce so-called universal concepts bottle, water, table, right? Now, these are concepts, so-called universals, and they are abbreviations, actually, for theoretical concepts here. Water, bottle, right? They're all theories. Now then, we have four special premises. 
already mentioned the logical objection against the possibility of content and logic and truth-preserving inferences, inductive inferences, which Hume embedded in his theory of causality. By the way, uh, I'm not going into this short of time. And we have those two requirements defining empirical science as it were Strict universality, remember, this is a result from analyzing the structure of explanations which you find in the library. It's not a normative prescription. It's a transcendental issue. And empiricism, the truth values of empirical statements are decided by experience exclusively, the principle of empiricism. Strict universality, the laws and theories science proposes are strictly universal. Not a good explanation to explain strict universally, uh, strict universal. But the point is, if you remember, strict universality means they claim to be true, independent of time and location. And of course, they have to be empirical. For if they were definition, definitions, the whole explanation would collapse into a definition. Right? And for reasons regarding the solu different solutions of the problem of induction and demarcation, we need to introduce the additional premise of full decidability. That is, the truth values of genuine statements of science must be fully decidable. That is, it must be possible in principle to prove either the truth or falsity. Now, by rejecting one premise, one special premise at the time, we get those five positions. Naive inductivism. Naive inductivism tries to introduce a principle of induction. So for instance, if you read Schlick, second edition, Eigemann der Erkenntnis, the general theory of knowledge, you'll find that Schlick, like Mill, like Jevons, like many other authors who tried to solve that problem, like Keynes, John Maynard Keynes also tried to, uh, to solve that problem, introduced a kind of principle of induction, and Schlick maintained that that was the principle of causality, that every effect has a cause. Of course, that does not suffice in order to justify a content enlarging and truth-preserving inferences, because that principle of induction necessarily needs to be specific general, it needs to be strictly universal, and it needs to be empirical in order to justify statements like all swans are white, which are strictly universal, empirical, and proven true. Now then, I'm not going, I do not have the time to uh, explain all those positions. Perhaps it's interesting to note a priorism is an inductivist solution. Kant tried to find synthetic judgments that are a priori true. And once we had some, if we find such a judgment, it is possible to use it as a principle of induction and justify inductive inferences. It's not what you may have heard in uh, your high school uh, gymnasium days that apriorism is kind of deductive uh, uh, position in contrast to empiricist positions. We have to distinguish between epistemological positions and logical techniques here. Now, pseudo-statement positions. The pseudo-statement positions, or which have been defended by several authors, some of them authors of pragmatism, maintain or interpret theoretical system as definitions of imp as systems of implicit definitions, right? In economics, for instance, neoclassical general theory, equilibrium theory maintains, or it's possible to interpret it, well, what individuals maximize is utility, and what they make, and what the, and utility is the thing they maximize, right? No empirical content here. So they circumvent these positions, circumvent the uh, the uh, the problem of induction and demarcation, because the solution of the problem of induction and demarcation would, of course, lie in showing that the two requirements of empirical science, that it's empiricism and strict universality, can be fulfilled simultaneously because Hume's objection provides or triggers a conflict between those two premises. So, if we regard 
theoretical systems as definitions of implicit definitions, we simply substitute, we have to substitute pragmatic values for truth values. Such systems are useful if they form the basis of predict, of making, or if rather inferring, successful predictions, right? Theories are just instruments for formulating successful predictions. And if those implicit definitional systems do not supply the basis for inferring successfully, strictly, uh, sorry, singular observational, singular predictions, singular statements, formulating predictions, then they are unsuccessful, right? So the point is, it is impossible to resolve the conflict between B and C and D, but it is not necessary to solve it if A is rejected. Strictly universal statements are not genuine statements of science, but pragmatic entities, and the conflict between B and C and D is irrelevant to success. So you may look at theories as kind of instruments which form the basis for providing singular observational statements. And we assume that it is always possible to classify singular statements as true or false. Likewise, we have deductivist solutions. The premises are here similar to the ones or like to, uh, to the inductivist, only the general premise is, has been changed here. Induction does not exist in the logic of knowledge. You find authors frequently maintaining that, although it is true that no such thing as a content enlarging and truth preserving inference exists, we cannot justify inductive inferences unless we introduce some kinds of justification. You may generalize. They still maintain that psychologically we are or we, uh, we form, we, we form uh, inductive inferences. But even if all of you would form inductive inferences, it does not justify a content enlarging and truth preserving that is inductive inference. Now, there's one solution, there are several deductivist solutions. Conventionalism maintains, well, theories are always correct, uh, but if we build an instrument of measurement, such a telescope, it is based on the theory, and if that telescope provides data which are in conflict with the theory, we have a methodological rule maintaining, ah, the theory is correct because it is, an analytic, it is a system of analytic definitions. However, if data conflict with the theory, let the model, let the instrument of measurement go. Such positions are quite old. In the 20s, there's a famous philosopher, Hugo Dinger, who developed such a position. I'm not going into intuitive universalism. That was a position developed by Otmar Spahn. I'm not going into that. Hypothesis and critical rationalism is the solution offered by Karl Popper. Basically, he changes two premises here. Full decidability, he maintains that theories that are strictly universal and empirical are only partially decidable. They are not verifiable, they are, cannot be verified, but can be decided, but can be falsified. And this is why it's so important to see that the logical equivalent of an affirmative, strictly universal, strictly universal statement that is empirical is a negative universal existential statement. That is, all swans are white, and the, the logical equivalent is there exist no non-white swans. It excludes something. We have potential falsifiers. Laws are called laws because they forbid something. Right here. Now, there are other changes here as well. Popper gives up the idea that certainty, right? So we do, it is impossible to maintain to prove either the truth or falsity. We cannot, and the idea here is to split the idea of truth and certainty, right? 
A verified statement is a statement the truth of which is proven true. And accordingly, it is possible to classify that statement with absolute certainty as true. And similar arguments hold for the probability position, for probabilification. Although there are difficulties to develop a concept of a probability hypothesis here. Now, on that, so this simple solution based on partial decidability of theories shows how those two requirements, defining empirical science, that is empirism and strict universality, can be retained, uh, can be fulfilled simultaneously. That's the solution of the problem of induction and demarcation. Empirical science is characterized by those two requirements, which can be uh, fulfilled by trying to, uh, which uh, if we regard theories as conjectures, as provisional conjectures that are partially decidable. If a theory passes the most severe test we can think of, all we can say is that the theory has passed the test. And accordingly, we have no reason not to classify that theory provisionally as true. And if it fails, it has failed. You have to distinguish here three different concepts, that is falsifiability, falsification, which just relates to the sentences. Falsification, the falsifiability relates to uh, the possibility of the theory to be false, that is, the theory has empirical content. The uh, 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 falsification relates to the actual issue, as it were, but it does not mean that you reject. So if you observe a black swan, of course, it is in conflict with the theory of all swans. Now, the Mickey Mouse version of the Popperian solution suggests, all right, if there's a black swan, Peng, let the theory go. But that's, of course, uh, 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 imbecile. Nobody would uh, do such. So you need a methodological theory, a methodological rule, in order to reject the theory. Based on that solution, just one more sentence and then I'm finished, is Popper's idea of verisimilitude. As I said, the idea of testing a statement, testing a theory, is just, the outcome is that all you can say is a sum, or you can may do is a summary of the past performance of the theory. You do not claim anything regarding its future validity. A verificationist or a probabilificationist claims something regarding the future performance of the theory because if I maintain that the theory is verified, I maintain that the theory is proven true with absolute certainty. And accordingly, if it's proven true with absolute certainty, it will, it makes a claim regarding its future performance. Verisimilitude is the idea that we just are capable of summarizing the past performance of a theory. Now, Popper tried to develop a formal measure for verisimilitude because frequently it is the case that you have a series of falsified theories. In the social sciences, every model to a certain extent is false. It's an abstract consideration, description of an actual situation. So you have a series of false theories. How do you choose between those theories? And it would be lovely. It would be extremely lovely to have a measure according to which you could rank the theories according to the verisimilitude. That didn't work. David Miller and Pavel Tichy, who unfortunately died young, showed that for logical reasons it is impossible to develop such a measure. But what you can do is you may try to summarize the performance of a theory by trying to have indicators for the quality of that theory, and you may try to pose questions to the theory and try to by finding answers to those questions. So, for instance, T2 makes more precise than T1, and accordingly, it has to be inferred, right? T2 takes into account and more facts, etc., etc. So, by 
proposing questions to the theory regarding its performance, you probably are capable of developing, a, uh, grading those theories. And those are, of course, pragmatic decisions. And those pragmatic decisions are influenced by sociological, economic, and uh, other uh, values, right? Cost, for instance, consider the cost of establishing a new experiment here. So you have to choose between a series of false theories, right? So we can retain the idea of scientific progress. And of course, sociological and other power factors have an influence regarding those decisions. But we also may maintain that it is rational to choose that theory that has a higher verisimilitude because it has more explanatory power, it is more general, it is more simple, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, everything boils down to empirical content in this Popperian theory. Now, one may object to that because it's just a one-dimensional evaluation of the, uh, uh, of the quality of a theory. And that has been done by critical rationalists, for instance, Klaus Peler, Qualitätsmerkmale Wissenschaftlicher Theorien. Right. So let me just summarize here the point I was making. The point I tried to do, uh, I tried to show is that those epistemological positions have different consequences regarding the interpretation of scientific progress. If you look, for instance, conventional, at conventionalism, right, you'll find that scientists agree on the theory. And accordingly, once they reject the notion of empiricism, they are experienced to be the internal standard which theories have to meet you are bound to explain scientific progress by sociological theories and psychological theories. And that was the basis of the Popper Kuhn Lakatosh Firearm debate, which was not new because Hugo Dingler developed similar explanations regarding the development or regarding scientific progress as Kuhn later did. So, we can talk about rationality of science. We have the possibility to choose between theories rational. And I want to stop with this remark. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Milford, for this inspiring talk. So, um, we have a little change in schedule. Um, we will shift Professor Baraka's talk for after lunch, so we have a little bit more time for discussion now. And also, we are a little bit late. So, um, if one of you has a question on the talk, please ask it now. <laughs> I admit it was a bit pedestrian, the talk. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, you were mentioning that there is like an, uh, a social acceptance in science. So if a theory is proven valid, then in it, uh, to some degree it is accepted uh, of this uh, scientific community. Um, connecting this to the talk we had before uh, about democracy, don't you see a, a similar um, evolution of how um, the acceptance of experts um, uh, evolved with the um, experts in democracy. We, um, there are politicians responsible for our well-being and there are scientific experts responsible for what we see, see as the truth. Um, yeah. How does that cope with action? With the, with science being free and being that you are free to um, improve on, on, on the, in the scientific debate that you can... Quite so. Thank you. The point I was making was 
that we do not have to give up the idea of rationality of science, right? The intrinsic quality characteristic of theories according to which we can discuss them. If we discuss issues not in terms of justification of influences or authority, but just by relating problems and solutions and theories are solutions, we are always capable of evaluating by critical arguments the performance of the theory. This is the idea I wanted to rescue because it became much under pressure uh, due to the later debate of Kuhn, Lakatos, and Feyerabend. Incidentally, Kuhn, in the so-called chilled volumes of the Library of Living Philosophers, has a fa uh, publishes a famous article maintaining uh, the title of which is Logic of Discovery or Psychology of Research. And the point of that article is to say that we get better insights into scientific progress, not scientific development, scientific progress is the issue, by looking to the psychology or sociology of, uh, of, 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 of scientists, or as Lakatos later maintains, scientists are elite, the elite of rational individuals, and accordingly, we ought to form our methodological considerations according to the behavior of scientists. This was an idea which I tried to reject here. I do not deny that uh, there are fashions uh, and uh, sociological uh, problems or problems of power influencing the development of theories. So, for instance, you have this peer review system. They're experts. Now, today you'll find that about 99% of the articles that are submitted to top journals are rejected. But you'll find, if you look at the development of journals, that these uh, that the rejections follows a certain fashion. So, for instance, today as an economist, if I want to be top ranked, I have to do game theory, whether I want it or not. I have to publish in game theory, right? So there are fashions, and those fashions are determined by sociological, but also by uh, questions regarding the autonomous development of science. So I do not deny that. So there are experts, and those experts determine, for instance, what is being published or what not. If you come, if you hand in the paper trying to, uh, uh, trying to, uh, 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 writing something which is not in the midst of the, uh, of, the, of uh, what Kuhn calls normal science, it will probably be rejected. Now, I do not deny these things, right? I just find them not very interesting. What matters is the performance of theories. You can raise similar issues with non-empirical theories. Consider, for instance, art. In the medieval times, you have pictures with no uh, perspective, right? because it was thought that the task of the artist is to inform the holy community in the church. So the major information is in front of the picture, and the less, less important information is in the rear of the picture. During the Renaissance, this changes. You'll find perspective here, because it was thought that the task of the artist is to convey the information of the holy story to the holy community in the church as being a witness, an eyewitness to that story. And accordingly, perspective was, perspective uh, uh, drawing was, uh, and painting was reanimated. There were some pre-runners already in Greek here, right? So I do not deny psychology or sociology, but sociology and psychology are empirical disciplines, and so we are back to the demarcation problem, and why is it why is the demarcation problem and the problem of induction so important? It has relevance regarding our expectation of scientific progress, and it is of relevance. Uh, 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 it is uh, of relevance also uh, uh, not only for uh, the explication of scientific uh, progress, but particularly for what we think are the internal critical standards which theories have to meet, right? 
Uh, my question concerns the Kuhn Popper uh, yes. discussion. Oh my and, God. <laughs> oh I mean, my God. In, in the, in, uh, but not the part that, that you probably don't like. Uh, <laughs> in the in the last two chapters of, of, of structure, yeah. there there is this picture of um, scientific progress by means of the puzzle solving yes. ability of, of theories. So yes. I'm just curious, was there a next change between Kuhn and, and Popper about oh, this? Yes, and a... I mean, at a first glance, at least. It seems that the puzzle solving ability uh, gives a quantitative measure that very, 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 very similitude uh, doesn't provide. And then, no, no. what was it, the response, it, look, or what is well, your response? The idea to of this? puzzle solving actually is a Wittgensteinian expression, which Kuhn took from Wittgenstein. And the second thing is uh, that Kuhn probably we disagree heavily. It can be true anyway. No, no, it is, it is. And, uh, and, and the second issue is uh, we, where we do not disagree, I regard Kuhn to a large extent to be a conventionalist because his PhD uh, supervisor was G.B. Conant who defends uh, conventionalist positions. Now regarding the issue of normal science and revolutionary periods, right? Now Popper in the famous uh, book uh, by Ellen Musgrave criticism and the growth of knowledge acknowledges, of course, the existence of normal science, right? Sometimes scientists simply are occupied by puzzle solving. This is normal science, right? They do not question the paradigm as it were. My, my, my yeah? question is, these are two different quantitative measures. So in the case of no, no. Kuhn, you have no, 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 no. n puzzles to be solved, yeah. and in the other, we have n persons of true propositions. So no, 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 no. The... The, the question here is whether or where to direct the falsification of tests, right? If you remember that paper on psychology of logic of discovery or psychology of research, Kuhn makes his reverences to Popper, mainly to issues where they share, there's no problems. And then he says, yes, but testing never is directed against the total theory. It's just directed against small bits of the theory, right? Now, that may be perfectly true, and Popper admits that this is the case. But logically, if we try to falsify, for instance, this brilliant explanation regarding the death of Professor Milford here, right? You'll direct automatically the falsity of the prediction, explanation and prediction are logically symmetrically here, right, to the total theory. Now, parts of the theory may be not testable, right? You have metaphysical ideas which are not testable. So you have to add those procedures by trying to isolate the testable bits and pieces, right? As I said, verisimilitude is a very metaphysical concept. I admit that. But what, you, what, what I try to maintain is that there's something about the problem-solving capacity of theories. We develop theories in order to get information, right? And of course, we want to know which theory is better than the other one. I do not share the instrumentalist view. I have a Keynesian theory explaining that income is determined by aggregate demand. I have a monetarist theory explaining that real effects do not matter in economics. As you know, this, uh, uh, this conflict uh, was triggered uh, by explanation regarding the Great Depression, right? I want to know which of the theories I have to choose. And if I develop a more general theory, this more general theory has to have more explanatory power, integrating monetarist and Keynesian positions. But that means that they are more easily falsifiable. So all these aesthetical standards with simplicity, uh, 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 generality, etc., which conventionalism has to introduce because it rejects empiricism to be the critical standard of theories, our reform in the preparing sense are reduced to empirical standard, right? Uh, empirical content, right? So the major clash between Kuhn and Popper is the idea 
of where to direct the falsification to. It's not so much verisimilitude, and we have no measure. But if students want to write a BA thesis with me or a master thesis, I confront them with those questions. And the results are actually quite good. We always think in terms of problems and solutions. And once you think in terms of problems and solutions, it is possible to critically evaluate the solution given the problem. This is what it's all about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. More or less in the same kind of topic. From the one hand, you said clearly that. Can you talk slower, please? Yeah. I'm an old deaf man. Yeah. <laughs> From the one hand, you say clearly that uh, it, we should not reject the idea of rationality in science. But on the other hand, and simultaneously, you say that this kind of rationality should be based in the performance of a theory. Sorry? In the, on the performance of the theory. In the performance of the theory, yes. <clears throat> in that sense, we could more or less argue that a rationale in this perspective overlaps with efficiency of a theory. No, efficiency is a different concept. Efficiency is a pragmatic concept, you may say, given uh, uh, for instance, uh, efficiency is actually a concept regarding to a certain technique, right? If you look, for instance, in the theory of business administration, efficiency plays quite a good role. Nothing not necessarily to do with the explanatory power of theories. We may say, for instance, the Keynesian theory has more explanatory power of a compared to a monetary theory, but that has nothing to do with efficiency, right? Okay. May I continue? Yes, yeah. yes, go on. Yeah, in that sense, okay, let's assume that the rationality of a theory is related or it, uh, it overlaps with the explanatory power a theory has. The thing is that the main issue I find in this perspective is that at the beginning, the most of scientific theories can have a kind of low explanatory power. Sure. Yeah, because there are not a lot of social expectations attached to a theory. Yes. So in that sense, the, the, the rationality as you present it is a factor that creates a stagnating science, a science, that, a science that doesn't go forward. No, 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 no. no. Uh, I, do not deny, I do not deny that, uh, 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 that uh, political factors, fashions, etc., etc., may influence the actual development of science. But here we are talking about scientific progress, that is the performance of the theory. And what I meant by rationality was that we do not have to give up the idea of rationally choosing between theories. Although perhaps the actual development may deviate from uh, this idea. Consider, for instance, uh, Nazis Jewish physics, right? Or con Nazis Jewish music. Or consider, for instance, a Stalinist, uh, 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 in Stalinism, certain realms in chemistry were forbidden. Uh, it was forbidden to do more research in that aspect. I do not deny that political power may hinder scientific progress. But I also do not deny that we need institutions in order to uh, uh, foster, in order to, 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 uh, uh, to increase the possibility of doing research. So we do not have to give up the rationality of science, and particularly to Kuhn, one of the, one, I should say, of the consequences of uh, Kuhn's book uh, was that uh, for linguistic reasons, for instance, some kind of incommensurable, incommensurability uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, proposed. Uh, there are wonderful uh, treatises by Benjamin Lee Worf on the Hopi Indians show, Indian, uh, showing that verbs, uh, uh, that uh, Inuits or, or, or Hopi Indians have verbs which are not in uh, Indo-Germanic languages, right? So they express, they formulate activities uh, which we cannot uh, formulate in, in, uh, or describe in statements. But that does not mean, and this is a side aspect of your talk, that 
we do not have to relapse into relativism, right? Of course, we are prisoners of a framework of values, of language, right? But that does not mean that we cannot talk to each other. That it does not, it does not mean that a French physicist discussing, let's say, special relativity will not be understood by his English colleague after the Brexit, right? So, you see, uh, these are all theses which aim actually to show that no rational discussion is possible in science at the extreme. And it ends up with relativism. However, I'll try to make a case for the rationality of science. And incidentally, if you look at the different uh, solutions, for instance, the inductivist positions here, naive inductivism, of course, proposes a solution saying, well, we can introduce a principle of induction and accordingly we can retain the idea of episteme, that is, scientific knowledge is proven true knowledge. And accordingly, any verified statement, which is a proven true statement, can be classified with absolute certainty as true. Now, Popper's answer to that is, you never get certainty. You never get partial certainty. Well, if you cannot have it, give it up, right? So, the point is, here you get a history of uh, a theory explicating scientific progress in terms of a linear accumulation of theories, because if only proven true theories are admitted to science, the later theory has to incorporate the previous theory. Now, that, of course, is a difficulty here, because if later theories aim at explaining anomalies of the previous theory, they have to be in certain conflict. And this is a position which the probability positions aim at solving, or at least which they try to trigger. So rationality means, actually, that you want to have critical arguments, or to put it even more generally. We talked about this already here, because I think uh, that uh, uh, Professor Nemet is quite correct to point out Neurath as a forerunner or foreshadower of non-justificationism. If, if you sit in the seminar and read your paper, and the terribly bored professor sit next to you, and he didn't listen, but then he starts asking, saying, where do you have that from? And then you look in your paper and say, I have this from X, Y, Z. And then he can, oh, where does X, Y, Z have it from? So you end up with such justificationist arguments, authoritarian arguments, you end up in an infinite regress, which can only be stopped dogmatically, perhaps by saying the Pope issued the decree, right? So justificationist arguments are not critical arguments. The point of criticism is to evaluate the performance of ideas, the performance of theories. And in order to evaluate the performance of theories, you have to describe the performance of theories and evaluate it according to some standards. And the standard is, of course, information. We want to know something about the world. OK, thank you. We have time for two more questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. I wanted to, to go back to the beginning of your talk. Right, ich bin hier. Oh, <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, uh, where you put the question, what is a satisfactory explanation yes. in social science? And I think it's a very, very, f on, not only well-formulated question, you showed how fruitful it is to, to, to put all these different approaches um, in, in this context and interpret them as answers to this question. However, my, my question now is the following. Um, it came to my mind that Ernst Mach, for instance, was very, very skeptical about whether or not explanation is, in fact, the aim of science. Okay, yes, right. and in, at least for the uh, for the late 19th century, he thought it was so full of, of presuppositions that he rather he said, well, maybe we put it in brackets, and we rather define what we are doing in a more direct, pseudo naive way, and say. 
before we talk about explanation, let's uh, let's let's say we describe phenomena in relation to uh, relation to each other and try to find mathematical um, uh, functions for yes. this. Okay. So my question is: Is there in social science, let's say, this type of discussion sometimes going on? Asking the question whether or not is explaining. Uh, the aim of social science. Maybe there are different possibilities to define oh, yes. this. Oh, so yes. not necessarily the Machian way, but just this, uh, because here it, it looked as if there was, it, it was just the joint question, and it, it has, uh, maybe it has been questioned sometimes whether or not this yes. should be the leading question. Well, in economics, you have that I'm not talking about physics. I don't pretend to know anything about physics. So, uh, but in economics, uh, usually methodological debates are triggered by open problems of the discipline. And one central issue in economic theory, and that's the proof of the pudding, as it were, in easy in eating, is that you have to explain satisfactorily exchange of commodities. If you cannot explain the institution of exchange of commodities or of relative prices, you cannot explain anything in economics. You cannot explain the distribution of income. You cannot explain the allocation of resources via markets. Now, that was an open problem. It was an open problem at the turn from the 18th to the 19th century. You probably have heard of Adam Smith, and Adam Smith explained relatively, relative prices or exchange ratio by a co labor cost theory, maintaining, well, uh, if it takes two hours uh, to catch a beaver and one hour to catch a deer, uh, beavers and uh, deer uh, uh, exchange at uh, one half, or, to, or if you, uh, or the reciprocal value. However, once you introduce capital, so this is just an explanation for a tribe where there exists no capital. They have no bows and arrows, no fisher nets, nothing like that sort of thing. Once you introduce capital in such an explanation, the explanation collapses because they, the relative prices, lovely, there's some chalk and a good old blackboard, relative prices do not correspond to I is the real interest rate here, correspond to labor costs here if the time cycle, the life cycle of capital here is different. Now, there are many other arguments against labor cost theory. Do not confuse that with labor theory of Marx. Ricardo, of course, knew that. And the result of this was, well, you get a very heterogeneous prior theory based on such a theory evaluating uh, the, the, uh, the evaluating, uh, and, uh, explaining the evaluating behavior of individuals, right? The price building for capital, for resources, had to be different compared to the pricing of final commodities, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this explanation was criticized by German economists. And this, they introduced the so-called theory of subjective evaluations. But that theory of objective evaluations got stuck into a taxonomy regarding the psychological motivations determining supply and, uh, reservation or supply and demand prices. And they did not have a measure according to which individuals evaluate one unit of a stock of commodity. So we had two different unsatisfactory explanations of exchange and relative prices. And that triggered debates regarding what is the structure of a satisfactory explanation. <coughs> Some authors, like, for instance, Hufeland, a Kantian, who published 1807, developed early concepts of uh, methodological individualism. He tried to explain economic phenomena institutions by 
trying to structure his explanations such that prices, money, are the unintended outcome of the interplay of intended actions. Now you note that you get a specific research program with this idea. You get the research program that first you have to describe or explain the evaluative behavior, the decision of individuals, then the interaction, and then show how institutions are the unintended consequence of uh, intended actions, of the interplay of intended actions. On the other side, historism uh, developed, and that idea, for instance, Russia, the doyen of, uh, the doyen of, of German econ economics, simply transferred old Baconian ideas to economics. They thought, this is all trash. Or even if individuals act on markets, they act within the cultural social framework. And to explain this cultural social framework on an individualistic basis according to the principles of methodological individualism is obsolete because whenever you try to propose an individualistic explanation, you have to presuppose another framework. And if you explain that framework on an individualistic basis, you have to reissue a framework. Yes, right. I'm, I, one sentence, right? So you get, so you have, so you have an ultimate, so the task, the scientific standard, the characteristic of science to propose ultimate explanations had to fulfill by some other means. And the idea was, well, history is the empirical basis of the social sciences. And by generalizing from that empirical basis, we are capable to induce, for instance, correct prior theories. This is just one example. There are many others. Usually, well, sorry. Maybe we can stick to short questions and short answers because we don't have much time left. Oh, I don't questions. know if I'm capable of short uh, very answers. <laughs> A very short question, but I will formulate it in two. Here. Here. Yeah. A very Here, short yeah. question. I will formulate it in two yes, or three right. ways. How do you separate science from the scientist? And in another way formulated, where is science located? Yes. Uh, because here is location is yes. a big problem. Yes. And uh, uh, linked to this, uh, if it is not possible to locate it somewhere else than in the scientist, then what is the role of, of, uh, of argumentative power in the sense of rhetoric, not in something there, right. uh, uh, in, in, in economics and all of the studies of McCloskey and others, but it's not right. much written about rhetoric. But uh, my main question is, uh, how is science separated, or theory separated from the theorist right. in, in, at, at all? Yeah. Short answer, no, objective knowledge, knowing without a subjective uh, sender. It's trivial, of course, that to develop a theory, we need to have scientists, brilliant scientists. Science is a wonderful, fantastic enterprise. It <coughs> requires a lot of fantasy, right? And of course, in order to discuss, you need to have individuals. But there's something as the content of the theory, which is not dependent of the knower. Where is it? It's in the world three, as Popper calls, or as Bolzano, uh, as Bolzano says, it is the content of the theory, what it maintains. It? And it's, it's independent, and it's independent of me. It's, for instance, in the library. When I was young, okay. when I was young, we had to have what it's called, I don't know the English expression, logarithmentafeln, right, all right? But the point is, nobody uses them anymore. Does it mean that the knowledge contained in those books disappears because we do not have a knower? No, it's certainly there. It's knowing without a knowing subject. And these are metaphysical theories and of Bolzano, I think, has developed a much better theory to that extent uh, than, uh, than, uh, uh, than Popper. Right? Just a short answer. All right? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. It's a most important question because is knowledge only subjective or is there something like objective knowledge? Knowledge without a knower. If the library disappears because Trump presses the button, right, okay, 
Well, does it disappear? Yes, it does disappear, the knowledge. But we are, in fact, capable of, for instance, reviving so-called dead languages. Right? So knowledge does not simply disappear with the death of the knowers. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one last question. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> in may the, may in I the, come up to you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the polarity of positivism and scientific or yeah scientific realism, uh, where is the presented approach located? I'm not talking about realism here, right? I do not maintain anything about ontological structures. Popper is, of course, a critical realist, right? But uh, and he's not a positivist, of course, mm -hmm. right? But I'm just talking about. Science. I'm talking about the structures of explanations which I find in the library. Right? I do not presuppose, for instance, the existence of regularities or of laws. For instance, in the social sciences, there was an old argument going like this. In the physical sciences, we are capable of employing inductive methods because there is regularity in the physical uh, universe. Whereas in the social universe, you have only change, right? Accordingly, inductive methods cannot be employed there because a presupposition of uh, inducing regularities or laws is the possibility of making repeated observations. Incidentally, Kant's, trans, uh, Kant's attempt to prove uh, uh, the, uh, the validity of uh, synthetic judgments a priori is based on this, right? Anyway, but, in his transcendental deduction, but uh, I do not need any presuppositions regarding the ontological structure of the social or uh, natural universe. I simply propose laws. I simply note that scientists maintain or uh, introduce such kind of statements. Right? So in a way, I'm a critical realist, but it does not play a great role here. Thank you very much. Uh, was there another thing? No, good, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks again for the interesting discussion. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so the, the plan is now we have an info point for lunch, just in front of the lecture hall where you found the coffee. <laughs>